Hello again. We hope you're enjoying the faculty breakout sessions and that you're learning about the groundbreaking research happening on campus. Queen's takes pride in being an institution where our faculty members, researchers, and students have an impact on the daily lives of people across Canada and internationally. We also want to recognize the hard work many people in the Queen's community are doing every day to protect us all during the pandemic. Professor Troy Day is a mathematical biologist serving on the Ontario government's COVID-19 modeling group. He uses data to develop models that predict the spread of the virus, which help officials make better public policy decisions. He has a video in an FAS Expo booth if you'd like to learn more. You may have seen Queen's professor and infectious disease expert, Dr. Gerald Evans on national television. He's been talking with media outlets to help inform the public about issues such as safety of vaccines and explaining the latest COVID-19 research. Dr. Kieran Moore is a 2011 Master of Public Health grad who earned praise as the Chief Medical Officer for the City of Kingston Region and his proactive approach, including adopting a public mask mandate, one of the first regions in the country to do so, by the way. His approach is one of the reasons the Kingston area has only had six COVID-related deaths. And early this year, he became the Chief Medical Officer of Health for the province of Ontario. And of course, we give thanks to the thousands of Queen's doctors, nurses and administrators and frontline workers in the healthcare industry. People like Jordan Bast, who only weeks after graduating from the nursing program in spring 2020, stepped up to work in a Toronto long-term care facility that was going through a deadly outbreak during the early stages of the pandemic. 95% of the residents had tested positive, and there were several COVID-19 related deaths. But Jordan spent several weeks there because she's passionate about caring for people. And so are the people you're about to see. It's time for one great doctor to put the spotlight on another great doctor, an accomplished cancer researcher. Dr. Jane Philpott is the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences and has spent more than 30 years in family medicine and global health. She may be best known to you as the former Member of Parliament for Markham Stouffville. She served in several prominent portfolios, including Minister of Health and Minister of Indigenous Services. Today, Dean Phil Pott is with Queen's Dr. Elizabeth Eisenhower, a researcher who has transformed the fields of cancer clinical trials and cancer drug delivery. Dr. Eisenhower's contributions to the clinical evaluation of new anti-cancer agents have been critical in the development of new treatments for ovarian cancer, malignant melanoma, and brain tumors. Earlier this year, Dr. Eisenhower was awarded Canada's top medical research prize, the Gardner Whiteman Award. D Dean Philpott, Dr. Dean Philpott, Dean Dr. Philpott, over to you. Thank you so much, Sheila. What a pleasure to be introduced by you. Thank you so much for hosting the events uh, throughout our homecoming weekend. It's fabulous to have you with us. And I know everyone that's tuning in today is enjoying connecting with their alumni, friends and colleagues. So thank you to everyone who's joined us for this session, which I think will be one of the highlights of your weekend. I am so delighted uh, to be presenting to you Dr. Elizabeth Eisenhower, who is no stranger Stranger to the Queen's alumni family, of course, uh, but we are particularly delighted to honor her this year as she has been uh, acknowledged in yet another phenomenal award, uh, recognizing her contributions to research. And just to give you a little teaser as well, a little later in the program, we're going to be bringing in uh, Dr. Janet Dancy, who is uh, ha has essentially uh, taken the baton, as it were, as, uh, as our new director of the uh, Canadian uh, Cancer Trials Group. So uh, Janet will be bringing you up to date with how the work that Elizabeth helped to get underway has continued and is continuing to have an international impact on cancer research. 
So uh, that's a little bit about what's ahead. And I just want to remind everyone that you can feel free to add some comments or questions in the chat, and we'll try to get to those. But I'm going to start things off with Elizabeth. And again, Elizabeth, it's such an honor uh, to have you in our community. And you have been so generous with your time uh, and con your continued work in the community. But let's go back a bit. Let's look at uh, when the Canadian Cancer Trials Group started some uh, some time ago, I'm sure there are some alumni joining us today who might not be aware of this incredible group and that it's based here at Queen's, the work that it does, which literally has an impact on people's lives all around the world. Tell us a bit about how the group came together and what your vision was at that time. Great. Well, thank you, Dean Philpott and uh, Sheila for the wonderful introduction. It's my great pleasure to be here today. Taking you back to the origins of the Canadian Cancer Trial Group is taking us back in time 40 plus years, really. Um, it was in 1980 that the Canadian Cancer Society uh, first funded a national cooperative clinical trials group, then called the National Cancer Institute of Canada Clinical Trials Group, and more recently renamed the simpler title of the Canadian Cancer Trials Group. But the goal at that time was to bring together um, uh, clinical investigators from across the country who had already begun to collaborate in doing academic clinical trials to find new treatments for Hodgkin lymphoma, for melanoma, and for lung cancer, and to consolidate that uh, network, if you will, into a formal cooperative group. And they, they uh, searched for a director of the group. And in actual fact, Dr. Joseph Pater, who was a uh, Queen's member of faculty, I think he'd only been there about three or four years, was selected. And because he was in Kingston, the group moved here. <laughs> so um, the Canadian Cancer Trials Group was, was officially inaugurated, if you will, in 1980 with the appointment of Joe Pater. At that time, it's important to underscore there were three vital components to having a group like this. One was a willing network of scientists and clinicians who wanted to work together to answer questions relevant to cancer treatment. You also needed to have cancer centers and hospitals agreeing to sign up for um, participation in the trials because those were the places the cancer patients who would be enrolled were treated. And the final component is the one that's based here, which is the, the um, head of what we called the statistical and operations office, but it was really the, the hub of the hive, if you will, where statisticians, clinicians, data scientists, and others work together to develop, conduct, analyze, um, and uh, comply with all the rules and regulations for clinical trials across the country. That, uh, as I said, the group started in 1980, but it was really clear <clears throat> within about a year or two that one big aspect of what people were interested in was not being addressed. And that was uh, a lot of patients and clinicians wanted to be able to access investigational cancer drugs, drugs that looked like they worked in mice, but we didn't know yet if they worked in people. And at that time, most of those drugs were being developed by the US National Cancer Institute. Ironically, perhaps, pharma was really not that into cancer drug development. It was seen as high risk with poor returns, so not worth going there. So uh, most new cancer drugs were coming through this National Cancer Institute pipeline in the United States. But to be competitive, we really needed to have a person whose job it was to know what was coming, to make sure there was interest, to put in you know, applications and to acquire those drugs for study in Canada. And that was why the Investigational New Drug Program was created. And they thought, let's hire a junior doctor who could do this for two or three years and then go do something more important. And that was me. And I'm not quite sure um, why I was hired, except that I was at Queen's and I was interested in this area. Uh, but no one really had the same experience that many people do now in clinical trials. So I accepted the job and one year led to three, which led to 35 more or less. And uh, that was the beginning. 
Now, Jane, you asked about my vision. I don't think I had too much of a vision right back then. I was 28 and I was just fresh out of hematology training. And I thought, well, let's just see if we can get some trials going. And I had to learn what a clinical trial was and what phase one and two trials were and um, learn from colleagues across the country and colleagues at the National Cancer Institute in the United States. So my vision was to um, make a little bit of a success of creating that network of people interested in this, create some success in actually getting new drugs for patients in Canada. And the nature of the vision I had for the group sort of evolved as we learned from success and built on ourselves year over year. Wow. It's, what a story. Yeah. What a story. It's, it's amazing. And to, to think that it grew from that, uh, those early days. And as you say now, decades later being this phenomenal engine of cancer research that, that yeah. impacts the world. It's, it's incredible. Let me just go back to your personal story a little bit there. You touched on it a bit, but I've, I've heard you describe yourself as an accidental oncologist. And <laughs> I wonder if you could tell uh, our audience a little bit about what you mean when you talk about that nickname. Uh, sure. I suppose people at the sort of far end of their career tell the story as if it's a connected and planned narrative. But in fact, we all know that there are all sorts of chance events and serendipitous things and opportunities that eventually form the trail that you follow. And the same was clear for me. Um, the only thing I knew I wanted to do was become a doctor. And um, since I was nine years old and um, I had a choice of going to Western or Queens. I was living in Ottawa at the time. And I thought, well, Queens is a bit closer, although Western gave me a bigger scholarship. Anyway, I decided to come to Queens. Um, so that was one kind of flip of a coin in a way, because it was closer to, to home. And when I was in medical school, in second year at that time, that was the time you really got to be exposed to um, clinical um, care and um, my clinical teacher was a hematologist named Dr. David Ginsburg, who was a fantastic teacher, um, somewhat of a, uh, I would say, Conan Doyle fan. He liked to make puzzles out of medicine. Mm. And I really admired him. I learned an awful lot. And because he was a hematologist, that mentorship made me quite interested in that field. So a bit of an accidental journey from medicine into hematology. And when I did my hematology fellowship, there were no oncologists. This was before there was a specialty in oncology, probably at that time because there was, aside from radiation oncology, not much in terms of systemic therapy to offer patients. But over the course of my training, new drugs for solid tumors started to emerge and the hematologists by default became the cancer doctors. Mm. So I ended up being exposed to cancer medicine and, and medical oncology through my hematology training. And then with Joe Pater's arrival at Queens and the opportunity to work in the clinical trials group, I sort of followed the path uh, into clinical research as we discussed. So a lot of chance events sum together put me in the place of being in oncology in, a, in an institution where the clinical trials group was based, where I had an opportunity to work. So that was a bit of an accidental journey, um, I guess. Well, we're, we're all very grateful that, that all those uh, accidents or maybe designs of fate came together to, to bring you and your leadership and your talent. You know, one of the things I've noticed, Elizabeth, about you over the years is your incredible ability to build networks um, and to collaborate. I think that's been really powerful. You know, people think of researchers as, you know, the key, key ingredient is being a scientist, understanding scientific methods, uh, et cetera. But um, I think the big piece of it is just that ability to bring people together and you know that we've just actually launched our new uh, strategic plan yeah. in the queen tell sciences and we're calling it radical collaboration uh, because we think that that's actually our competitive advantage here at queens is that we are collaborators by nature um, so i'd be interested in your thoughts about you know what how has collaboration been part of your success story in your career 
Oh, that's a great question because I think if there's a secret sauce that describes all of the things I've done, it's been flavored with the spice of collaboration <laughs> because um, in um, one of the reasons actually I was attracted to oncology and to clinical trials was the culture within the oncology community was one of collaboration. There were, yes, there were eminent cancer centers in Canada, but this notion being driven by some of the leaders in those cancer centers that we will get there faster if we do it together really was an underpinning of importance. And it wasn't unique to Canada. We saw this in the United States and in Europe and many other therapeutic areas, the kind of clinical research happening was very much single institution or limited number of institutions gathered together for a single study and then dissipating. With the creation of these collaborative or cooperative groups, they were ongoing collaborations where mm -hmm. people interacted, learned from each other, raised questions of importance to practice, assimilated knowledge from um, uh, the science community as it evolved. And so without that kind of spice of collaboration, the, the networks, the clinical trial networks just simply would not exist. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so cancer was different and the culture of collaboration was important. And I guess I learned something through that because for me, it isn't so much about what I have done. It's always about what we have done and what I have been able to help make happen. I am not, um, terribly interested in, um, my own, uh, or, or getting praise for what I have done, to be frank. <laughs> I've always been a bit embarrassed. I really like being able to say, uh, working together, we were able to do this. And that started to spread from collaboration around um, colleagues who were working in the clinic together, to collaboration now with a whole network of basic science across Canada, bringing them into discussions about where cancer was, what we were learning about cancer biology, how to build on that, how to involve them in doing translational studies embedded in the clinical trials. Collaboration as well with funders and pharma, mm -hmm. because pharma eventually got the memo that cancer was a place where new drugs could make a difference. And so a lot of new drug development in the, especially the mid nineties to, to now has been driven by the science within pharmaceutical industry. But if you aren't a good collaborator in the sense that you have good ideas for which they will give you their drug to study, mm -hmm. you won't be able to, to uh, do some of that work. And I guess the final bit is, um, although people understand patients are collaborators in the sense of being part mm -hmm. of trials, with the leadership of people like uh, Joe, Joe Pater um, and now Judy Needham, who's part of the clinical trials group, patients have been partners in the research and collaborators in identifying what are the important questions and um, um, contributing to decision-making um, for at least two decades now. So the collaborations are sort of like rings in a pond, collaborate with with each other to do the trials, with scientists to get the ideas, with those who are developing the compounds we want to study, and with patients who ultimately not just participate, but benefit. Well, you have demonstrated that so beautifully, and it it, it, it does seem like it's second nature to you, but I think it's such a great uh, uh, demonstration. I wanna just jump, just touch on an, another thing that I think you've been a leader in, again, kind of accidentally, perhaps. And that's the fact that you have been a woman in medicine in and became a leader uh, during a time when we didn't really even talk about gender equity as much as we do now. Um, but you've held so many leadership roles in the faculty here. Uh, and, and one of the the, uh, the leaders as a woman department head, for example. So you know, what are your reflections on the role of, of being a woman leader and, and uh, building on demonstrating what it looks like for women to take leadership roles? That's an interesting question. And I often got asked um, 
especially in my junior years on faculty. How did I do this? I honestly don't have very many um, stories to tell about that. I would say, I mentioned when I was nine, I still have my diary when I wrote, today I decided I'm going to be a doctor. Mm. And um, I never heard from my parents or from any teachers, oh, but you're a girl. That'll be hard. I only heard, good for you. And in medical school, I recall maybe one or two episodes of what could be construed as sexist behavior. Although the bar for sexism, I think was probably higher then and it's lower now, but the bar, um, what it, whatever it was, one or two episodes only from uh, faculty or teachers. Mm. Um, it seemed to me normal to be doing what I did. I was um, enabled and facilitated not just by my teachers, but also by my husband, who's a family physician, who just never seemed to think that it made sense to worry about whether I could do something if I were interested in the challenge and willing to put some thought behind it. I have to say, I was the first trainee in medicine here to go on maternity leave. Mm. And that was interesting because no one knew how to deal with it. No one knew how to deal with it. So I came up with a proposed solution. I think I took three months off and I decided to uh, work three months for free and be paid for three months or something. And that was how it, it worked its way in. I was the first female faculty member in the Department of Medicine. But it didn't feel weird or abnormal because people treated me like a colleague and not as something um, weird. Hmm. And and I think, I mean, we talk an awful lot about equity, diversity, and inclusion today. And on reflection of why it seemed a fairly easy pass for me was that I was treated equitably as a child and as a student and as a trainee. And um, I guess that's a testimony to the importance of, of not just... Uh, the system you're, you're, you are in, but in the people I just happened to be working with. There was, there was um, no sense that I had to work harder as a woman or that I should be doing more or differently. The, the fact that to be a full-time clinician in that time was complicated, but made easier by the fact that we had the financial wherewithal to hire help at home. And I think the fact that my husband thought go for it, was kind of made it all come together. So I, I feel a bit embarrassed that I can't offer some really, really wise words here. Um, but I would say that having a, an educational system and um, in, in health professional educational system that is equitable and where uh, people are not singled out for any reason other than their merit and their interest uh, makes, big, makes a big difference, I assume. Well, you've certainly been a role model in so many ways, and uh, there are lots of people uh, of uh, across the spectrum who look at you and see what you've done and are inspired and, and challenged. So let's kind of fast forward now because I want to bring it back to the present day. And I was so excited when I heard that you uh, were the winner of this year's Gardner Whiteman Award. It's the most prestigious biomedical research award in the country. It's a, it's a massive honor. And, you know, it, it uh, is a signal to the work that you have done, uh, th particularly through the cancer trials group. So, you know, kind of looking back on all of that and all of the things that led to your success and being awarded this, uh, this prize, is there anything that in particular of your accomplishments that you're most proud of, would you say? So <clears throat> I would say I was a little bit gobsmacked and um, a lot humbled uh, to be a, to receive that award. Um, the accomplishments, there's no one thing I can sort of pull out and say, oh, this is it. For me, there's sort of a series of things that I feel proud of. I feel proud that between when I started at the clinical trials group and finished, we had gone from a handful of people educated in, trained in, interested in um, evaluation of potentially new exciting cancer drugs in the country 
to dozens and dozens. Um, and that growth of a network of well-trained people, some of whom were fellows of mine, including Janet Dancy, who's the next guest, that made me feel really proud. It was like having being a parent to a, a very, very large family. So I was proud of that. I, of course, was proud of the fact that, again, whether by chance, good fortune, or good planning, we did some pretty exciting studies of some new drugs during my time there that um, led to the identification of active agents that have made a real difference in the lives of cancer patients. So everybody talks about the paclitaxel or taxol story. Um, there was a sister compound, taxotir, which is very active in breast cancer. Um, there were, you know, a, a list of drugs which were unknown quantities, sort of, when we studied them. We discovered they worked. We helped push them along to the next phase of investigation. And eventually, they sh were shown to improve survival and got used in practice. So it's hard not to be proud of that, because that was what we were trying to do. Amazing. Um, I would say uh, I'm kind of proud of the fact that we recognized early on that moving out of this comfort silo of just being a clinical researcher was important. We need to be thinking about the other disciplines that are related to oncology, not just the basic science, but also um, uh, quality of life, psychological endpoints, supportive care, mm -hmm. those things. And uh, again, I was not the driver of many of those collaborations, but I certainly was part of and support of them. Um, and I think uh, the other bit was we, because Canada is a rather unassuming country. It isn't the United States. People aren't afraid of it elsewhere in the world. We became a, a kind of favored partner for mm. colleagues in Europe and Australasia to partner to do clinical trials with. So those international collaborations that for me started with the first ovarian trials we did with Taxol and leaving that behind me and now an intergroup of about 35 groups involved in gynecologic cancer around the world working together. Um, proud, of, proud of that. I, I would say outside the clinical trials group, I'm, I'm also pleased I was able to participate in leadership of the Canadian Cancer Research Alliance and work with them to develop a pan-Canadian cancer research strategy to, get, to help get the funders of cancer research really trying to work more closely together and to fund projects that not any one of them could do on their own. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that was, a, a, I think, a, a, an important uh, contribution that I'm proud of. It's pretty hard to put it all in, in a few few minutes, well, with all of the things that you've done, but I wanna make sure we also think a little bit about the future, because I know you're, you're always forward facing. And, uh, you know, I'm, as, as Dean, I'm so proud that, that the Canadian Cancer Trials Group is here at Queen's and we have you know, incredible research spaces and you and, and, and now Janet have just done such an incredible job. Um, but we're kind of outgrowing our spaces. You know, the Canadian Cancer Trials Group, as you know, is, is literally <laughs> bursting at the seams and is, is, Truly, the research engine here at Queen's. It's a, the biggest uh, group, brings in an enormous amount of, 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 of honor to us as an institution. Um, I know uh, uh, Dr. Dancy and the team there would love to grow. And so we've actually, as you know, been thinking about the idea of a new building um, that would actually. Uh, be able to support the research, but as well, you know, education, and clinical care all in one place. So I'd be interested in your thoughts about that possibility, because it's a big dream of ours, this, this concept of a, of a new, really collaborative, interdisciplinary space uh, that could amplify cancer research along with the other, uh, other goals of the faculty. What do you think we could do together if we could actually uh, put together the resources to, to build new states and, and more facilities for the Canadian Cancer Trials Group? So I think that kind of thinking was certainly what was on our minds when, oh, I, I guess about 20 years ago now, we, um, we put our heads together and started talk around creating a cancer research institute here that would be the home for the Canadian Cancer Trials Group. 
that would be the home for multiple scientists looking in cancer biology. And that would be the home for um, a large group on health services and population research in cancer. And the vision was by having them uh, together in the form of an institute that was not just a piece of paper, but a physical place, mm. we could live, learn, and work together and create more, um, uh, create a richness in both educational experience and in research. Um, so I think, I think to eliminate physical silos goes some of the way to enhancing those transdisciplinary education and research activities. So I would applaud that. I think it would, uh, it could have some really important um, impact on uh, training education and research in other therapeutic areas. I also think that the, and maybe Janet, who I know is gonna speak later will, will just faint when I say this, but I think that the talent we've brought together around and know-how around how to do cancer research in the clinical trial setting could be leveraged into other therapeutic areas. It is not just simply writing a protocol and collecting data. There's innumerable uh, regulatory ethics and other um, um, aspects that need to be tended to, to be compliant with the law mm -hmm. that are not easy for academic researchers to do. And that know-how, uh, as well as the statistical know-how and electronic data capture lives within the clinical trials group. And it is possible, you could say, that maybe we could leverage that know-how and expand it into uh, other areas. So uh, definitely supportive of the idea of bringing people together. I think if you do it, I would, the one thing we forgot to do was to put a cappuccino machine in the atrium to gather <laughs> so that so that people could come together over coffee and have informal discussions because a lot of things happen, as you know, in the hallways of parliament versus the house, um, in the hallways of academia and hospitals versus the actual little offices and labs. So, well, we will definitely have to make sure there's a coffee spot in the, in the new building, but, uh, and, and I'm cognizant of the fact that we've got all kinds of wonderful alumni who are listening in. And I want to make sure that if they've come to uh, homecoming, thinking about the possibility of, of uh, how they can be part of this and make a contribution to the amazing research that's being done, um, that they uh, know that this is a, a great place to invest and support the work that you've started and that Janet and the team are continuing. So um, I will make sure that everybody has access to how they might be able to think about, about getting involved or can obviously reach out to you or me later to, to talk about, you know, wouldn't it be great if, uh, if we had a major donor who wanted to attach their name to our, our, our Cancer Research Institute? Truly um, so powerful, the work that's happening here. And, and, uh, so, you know, I just, I'm going to give you a, a minute or two before we pass over to, to, uh, Janet, but, you know, thinking about the future of cancer research specifically and what Queens can do in the future, uh, what do you dream about? Well, well, uh, cancer research, I mean, is more than just one thing. I think we, punch above of our weight here, not just in clinical trials, but I think also in other domains that are becoming very pertinent, computer, computing science and engineering, um, uh, basic science and pathology. Um, and I mentioned health services and population. So I think the big advantage we have, whether it's cancer or other areas, is the fact that we're small enough to know each other and to visit each other. The Ego factor is not that great. And in some ways that makes it easier for people to collaborate with groups in Kingston than it does in other large cities, maybe to the west of us. Although I don't know. Um, where cancer research is going, uh, a number of different things, obviously. <clears throat> I heard um, a very important talk from uh, the head of uh, one of the, uh, of IARC in Lyon, France who said a few years ago that the cancer burden is and will be so great internationally that we will never be able to treat our way out of it. So having spent 
35 years doing treatment research. This um, twisted the knife a little bit in a good way. It made me realize that as people interested in cancer research, we need to also be cognizant of, promote and make happen research in the prevention areas, early detection areas, uh, palliation and end of life. Because if we use only a treatment paradigm, we will always be one step behind. And if nothing else the pandemic has taught us is that putting all your eggs in a treatment basket is not wise. So um, I, that being said, there are some pretty exciting new areas in the treatment basket emerging around immune-based therapies, cellular therapies, um, uh, tailoring treatment more appropriately. Um, and there's always sort of a huge pipeline of investigational therapeutics coming, which some of which will also make a big difference. That's amazing to think of. And actually, this is a perfect segue to bring in Dr. Dancy now, but don't go away, Elizabeth, because okay. um, we've got some questions coming in in the chat and I want to introduce Dr. Dancy and then uh, we will uh, make sure that we leave some time toward the end for questions from our uh, participants here. So it gives me tremendous okay. pleasure to introduce another special guest uh, to our discussion here today. Uh, and you've heard uh, both Elizabeth and I refer to uh, Dr. Janet Dancy uh, I, didn't, I, I don't think I had put together that she was one of your fellows at one point along the way, Elizabeth, but that's really great. And is, of course, now a truly internationally renowned researcher who is doing groundbreaking work in clinical trials and cancer drug development. Um, she, I would say she falls a bit into your footsteps, Elizabeth, though, in that she is such an incredibly humble leader, um, has just has an, uh, a huge talent in bringing people together and making the whole organization work so successfully. Um, doesn't look for, for personal praise and adulation, but boy, she is uh, an incredible leader. We're so lucky to have her here. She, of course, was involved in, in helping in the founding of the Cancer Trials Group, and now she is leading the group actually in her second term now, I believe, as scientific director, if I've got my timing right. So, Janet, we would love to hear your take, maybe a bit on some of the things Elizabeth touched on, the future of cancer research. Uh, what, what can Canadians look forward to, and what are some of the innovations that the group is, is working on about, about treatment in the future? Oh, we'll pass over to you. And, uh, you're, you've got your mute on. Of course I have my mute on, because someone had to do that. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Dean Philpott, it's, uh, for the invitation to participate in this wonderful session. Thank you, Elizabeth, um, for allowing me to participate, allowing me to be your fellow. It was one of the great serendipitous moments in my life that I had the opportunity to be a fellow at CTG. It certainly changed my professional career. Um, in terms of the, the future of cancer research, I'll pick up on some key themes that Elizabeth brought forward. Um, I think it's clear to all of us within the field and maybe hopefully people outside the field, clinical trials research has changed dramatically over the last decade. And that is just gonna continue and I think accelerate. The questions we're asking are changing and the methods we are using to address those questions are also changing. There's this intersection now between biology, biochemistry, biophysics, and the digital spheres. So that the nature of the data that we're collecting, its scale and scope and diversity, and from the uh, patients directly, from samples that we're acquiring from them, this is creating a huge opportunity to understand and better tailor treatments. In addition, it's helping us understand and more directly um, from patients learn about their experience, their experience with cancer, their experience with the treatments that they're receiving, both immediately and long-term. The way we do trials now has changed dramatically. Again, picking up on Elizabeth's themes, we not only sort of very carefully set up a trial around a particular question, but we're now very much moving towards having very fluid and adaptive approaches to trials where we have protocols that might be addressing different types of treatments 
for different types of patients that can pro progress almost seamlessly from the very early phase of evaluating what might be the right dose and schedule to whether we're seeing hints of activity to suddenly launching into that big definitive trial, all within one protocol. Hmm. And the nature of our collaborations, our partnerships are just expanding. Um, I think when I started, it was, it was somewhat exotic to have a protocol where you had a radiation oncology uh, um, colleague working with a medical oncology colleague and those very exotic surgical, surgical types all within one study because the nature of the intervention required the expertise from all three. And then we brought in pathologists and we brought in laboratory scientists and now we have data scientists and we have psychosocial scientists all working together and also including patients directly into how we select the questions we're going to ask, how we design the protocol and what we what we would be asking a patient volunteers to be doing in the context of that trial. So trials now are not only more exciting, they're more complicated than probably mm. ever before. And so we need a, a very well-trained, committed, collaborative, and I would dare say humble team approach to getting them done. And those teams might be huge. We have a trial going on right now evaluating an immunotherapy in patients who've had surgery for lung cancer. And that trial involves literally thousands of investigators and clinical trial staff at hundreds of cancer centers in 22 countries around the world. Wow. And we've executed that trial prior, during, and now as we're emerging from the pandemic. Um, it's, it's been a fascinating, humbling experience, I would say, to do it and to do it successfully. And fingers crossed, we're, we're getting ready to analyze that study and fingers crossed it will be successful. Wow. So where we're going next, um, a lot of what we do, I think, is still focused on treatment and evaluating and finding new treatments. But a lot of it is also leveraging these new technologies to tell us and identify a cancer early, to identify the features of that cancer to select a better treatment, to evaluate whether that treatment is working, not just by traditional imaging, but also blood-based markers. And to look at that blood and see if there are new proteins or mutations detected in the blood that tell us we need to change a treatment and what that new treatment might be. So we're moving in further if along the trajectory towards if early detection, early interventions for treatment, reducing the burden of those treatments and tailoring them so that those who might need more treatment have the option of potentially having a new and innovative treatment in the context of our trials. And those who might not need as much treatment have the opportunity to have the burden of that treatment reduced. That's incredible, Janet. You know, cancer touches everybody, right? There's no, there's none of us that haven't been touched in some way in our families. And to think of the work that's taking place at Queens under your leadership, uh, as you're describing that trial, thousands of investigators and and hundreds of centers in 22 countries, and you know, presumably thousands of patients as well. And it's all being run under your leadership here at Queens and the Canadian Cancer Trials Group. That's, we should be shouting it from the rooftops about, about the incredible leadership, uh, the, the humble leadership that is actually making this very complex study possible and making sure that people are going to get the best treatment. So it's an it's enormous, uh, it makes me enormously proud and to have both of you here today telling these stories. I'm sure our audience is appreciating it. So I'm starting to get some questions coming in. Uh, I wanted to make sure we leave time now and people can, of course, put their questions in the chat. I'm going to try and, and uh, catch as many as I can. Um, one of the interesting questions uh, you both referred to, Elizabeth talked about uh, the patients being involved. So tell us a bit about, I mean, maybe there are people in the community now as patients that would like to be involved. Janet, how would they get involved in, in your initiatives? Any advice on that? Well, there are a couple of ways. Uh, 
Um, for us specifically, since actually the 1990s, we've had a patient representative committee, which is a standing committee um, of patient volunteers who serve on our scientific committees, our oversight committees, our disease specific um, scientific committees who are developing the trial proposals um, and contribute to defining and refining the questions we're asking in our trials, how we go about asking them, what should be the content of the patient materials. They have been hugely, hugely important to the work of our group. Um, and we regularly, if you like, um, are looking to fill positions on that committee. Um, and when we are um, looking for new, new um, patient representatives, uh, we generally advertise on our website. But certainly, you can always contact us from our website to ask what may be um, uh, available or what you're interested in specifically, and we can follow up on that. And then, of course, the second is, is um, if you would consider volunteering for a trial, um, at some point, hopefully it won't ever be necessary in your life, but um, we only advance across our um, healthcare practices. We only advance when we have evidence that something works and the evidence comes from clinical trials. Mm. And we could go faster, do better, um, if there were if there were greater interest and understanding, I think, and willingness um, to participate in those trials. And I think that was one of the key things that Elizabeth and Joe recognized when they fostered that early engagement in the patient representative committee, that it was really it's it's having a patient's involved in helping us make those decisions about trials and what trials we do that actually provides, if you like, the, 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 the core of uh, integrity uh, that what we're doing really reflects and be an important question um, that needs to be answered for patients. That's a, a great point. And you and Elizabeth are always uh, the first to, to recognize that we couldn't do this work without the patients that are part of an essential part of it. So, um, okay, a couple more questions coming in. Uh, oh, here's a bit of a, 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 um, a deep question from, from Guy, uh, who says, wants to know about artificial intelligence and whether or not that's being used to help model um, uh, new agents. Is that something that you want to jump in on? I don't know whether which of you might uh, might have some interest in terms of sort of, I know big data is a big part of what uh, what's involved now, but uh, have you got any examples off the top of your heads around how AI and machine learning have been helpful in, in making some predictions about study outcomes or um, the future of trials? There's been a lot of work on um, using AI in particular to help make sense of some of the complex data that are now held in large publicly available um, databases. So there is, there is, as people may know, uh, the cancer genome databases that basically now literally have thousands of cancer genomes uh, that have been sequenced and available. They are, um, Similarly, databases that have been created that have looked at pretty much all known chemical structures and interactions that have been reported from um, experimental uh, models, usually um, cell line models, um, to try to make sense of the correlation between a particular chemical structure and the disruption that might occur in these cancer cell line models, both at a, um, a level of it's, does the cell die or not, but also what pathways may be disrupted by looking mm -hmm. at proteins or RNA um, signaling that has been altered. So these, these huge data sets can be amalgamated and sifted through by people who are much smarter than I am to propose, if you like, what chemical structures might be most effective for particular aberrant pathways that might occur in um, cancer. 
AI is also being used in areas like imaging and interpreting imaging to determine which features might um, result in a more aggressive or less aggressive cancer. And when I talk about imaging here, I'm talking about both the imaging we think of that comes from a CAT scan machine or an MRI machine, but also the image that comes from taking a picture of a pathology slide um, and enhancing that uh, and resolving it um, from the data itself, from the digital data itself to look for features that might correlate. So this is actually a huge area of interest for us. We have projects underway with um, investigators, data scientists here at Queens, um, as well as outside of Queens, because we hold a, not only clinical data from our clinical trials and biospecimens from patient volunteers on those trials, but we also have data imaging holdings now, and we make all of that available to the broader community to be able to, to utilize and evaluate, to look for insights such as has been proposed by this, this individual. That's amazing. And that's a fantastic example of that kind of collaboration that we talked about and how far things have come over the, the decades to, to the point now where you, you know, you're describing so beautifully that it's not just the oncologists or the, whether they be uh, uh, medical oncologists or radiation oncologists or surgeons, it's also that entire team of computer scientists and, and data scientists. It's, uh, it takes a takes a massive family. Okay, so uh, I'm going to move to another question now, a little bit different topic. Um, it comes from Nicole from Edmonton. And uh, Nicole wants to know about the impact of the pandemic. And I think this you touched on this, both of you, a little bit briefly, but maybe we could hear a little bit more about, wow, what's it been like to try to keep things moving in this extraordinary uh, organization through the pandemic? Would either of you like to jump in on that? I'll let, um, I'll let Janet talk about um, the CCTG and the pandemic, and I'll just make a comment about, um, about the other things that the pandemic has taught us. So Janet, you can go first. Okay. Well, hi, Nicole Kane. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> I wasn't going to give it away. <laughs> um, so I will always remember... March at the beginning of the pandemic as um, the moment where I thought that I would not be able to go on. Um, we uh, And the month where I will forever be humbled and astounded at the way people pull together to respond and respond superbly to the pandemic and its impact on our research in particular. So remembering um, what was going on in that time, which we probably all have a little bit of PT, um, post-traumatic stress related to that, we had to figure out how to take 150 people based at Queens and get them working remotely. We had to figure out how across a portfolio of 170 active trials with thousands of patients across Canada and around the world, we're going to continue in a way that would ensure patient safety, clinical trial staff safety, that we could deliver the treatments to them if we could, if they were still receiving treatment, and that we could execute the trial and hopefully get the data um, so that we would still end up with a trial that we can analyze at the end of the pandemic. All of this was occurring, if you like, um, in a framework because our lens was across Canada and around the world, we were seeing impacts as they flowed across the world. Um, starting in China, because one of our tri trials has 10 sites in China, through Europe, Italy, Spain, and then of course here in Canada, NA and the um, series of lockdowns that were occurring in Canada. Um, at the end, we had managed to put out guidances for um, the trial participants or patients on those trials 
uh, to tell people what to do and how to do it. We figured out how to get drug shipped to everybody who was expected to get drug. We worked with and implemented the regulatory requirements from Health Canada and other regulatory agencies in terms of what they wanted to see in terms of trial conduct. It was a phenomenal effort. And at the end of that, um, I can say that uh, patients did well. Um, I can't say that they didn't find their experiences disrupted by COVID, but I think that they did well in the context of their trial. Trial staff did well. We did well overall um, in our trials. We'll, uh, at the end, still be analyzed, still have the potential for impact, and that impact could change uh, lives and save lives by defining new standards of care. Well, it was an enormous feat, but uh, you and your team pulled it off incredibly well, uh, despite all of the challenges. Elizabeth, you wanted to give a, a sort of a more of a higher level. Well, I wanted to um, comment that it was hard not to be impressed by what happened um, outside the area of clinical of cancer trials, but in the area of rapid evaluation of potential new um, agents that might be effective against COVID-19. And I think all of us were really impressed with the work done in the UK in the recovery trial where they sequenced through um, drug after drug after drug, laying to rest that hydroxychloroquine doesn't work, but steroids do. And uh, I, I don't know, six or seven so far coming through that machine. And they got up and running and enrolling patients within about six or eight weeks of when the pandemic um, hit Europe. And that is a testament to having a, um, what I call a research rich healthcare system. Years ago, the NHS decided to consolidate all the money they put into research into providing infrastructure to support clinical trials across the NHS and um, marrying that with um, teams uh, organized in various therapeutic areas, whether it's mental health or cardiology or infectious disease or cancer, that would utilize that infrastructure to run trials. Because of course, you can't just do a trial in a center. You need to hire data managers. You need to have someone put the ethics through. There's a whole, there's a cadre of people that need to support the work in the center. It's not just the patients and the doctors. And that I thought was a really useful lesson that we in Canada could learn from. Right now, the Canadian Cancer Trials Group, which has been continuously supported by the Canadian Cancer Society since 1980, does not receive any core funding from the federal government. The only um, clinical group in Canada that has any kind of federal funding is the AIDS clinical trial group. And I don't know really where that is now in its, in its work. So it's a bit of a political comment, but if we really want our healthcare systems to help us learn how to manage patients better, we need to create the infrastructure that enables that. And that's what happened in the UK. I think the other thing that I've seen, um, and I've been watching the questions too, and I know you're supposed to ask them, but this one's come up is around all these blood tests for early detection. Um, they sound really exciting, but they really, really need to be evaluated in um, properly structured trials to see if we are able to find cancers and it matters to find them early. Um, uh, as we know, many cancers, even when they're small, will leak protein or leak DNA or something like that into the bloodstream. So there are increasingly sensitive ways of finding them. But finding that you might have a cancer and actually locating where it might be in your body um, may be a bit of a challenge. So all of these things that sound exciting still need the clinical research done mm -hmm. to show that a, you can find it, and finding it early actually means you have a higher chance of being cured than if it was found a few months later by another mechanism. So um, exciting opportunities, but they need to be evaluated. And I, I sound cautious because we've been misled quite a few times in that space over the last four decades. Okay. 
I think we've actually just about run out of time. This has been so amazing and I know our audience has thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I, I think we, uh, we are going to have to wrap things up. I wanna say thank you to everybody who has come and participated. Um, Elizabeth and Janet, you are both an amazing inspiration to me and our country and our uh, Queens community are really indebted to you. Uh, so let's, uh, let's keep uh, supporting the amazing work happening at the CCTG and we look forward to sharing more stories of uh, the discoveries you're making there and how it's impacting the lives of Canadians. Thank you so much. Thanks for being with us, everyone. I want to thank uh, doctors uh, Eisenhower and Dancy and Dean Philpott as well. And I think if if I were doing a word cloud, I think the word that that kept coming up the most would have been collaboration. So much gets accomplished in the spirit of collaboration. Uh, building networks, collaborate, the ability to bring people together. Uh, Dr. Dancy talking about the intersectionality, creating opportunities to understand and create better treatments and bringing disciplines and specialties and patients together. Uh, so much of that, all leading to the name of Dean Philpott's uh, strategic plan for health sciences, radical collaboration. I also noticed there was so many thanks and, and gratitude in the chat for the work that you're doing. And it's, it's so appreciated. And to know that this is stemming from Queen's University and having such a huge impact, not only in Canada, but all around the world. It's so, it's just so exciting. That was a wonderful discussion. Uh, Dean Philpott, you're a fabulous moderator. And uh, I thank you again, uh, Dr. Eisenhower and Dr. Dancy for uh, a great Great discussion, and Dr. Phil Pot as well, of course. Queen's has 83 fellows of the Royal Society of Canada, 51 Canada research chairs, all of whom are trying to solve some of the world's biggest mysteries and answer the most pressing questions. So there's so much great work going on. And it's time to wrap up this segment of our homecoming program today. What else do we have in store? At 2 p.m., the School of Nursing is celebrating its 80th anniversary with a discussion about the school's current priorities and a look at its future. If you're a fan of Dragon's Den or Shark Tank, you'll want to watch the budding entrepreneurs at the Dunan Deshpandi Queen's Innovation Center as they pitch their startup ideas. At 3 o'clock Eastern, it's kickoff time at Richardson Stadium as the Gales take on the Carlton Ravens. And over at the Virtual Faculty of Law, there will be a live Q&A with Dean Mark Walters. So to learn about all of the online events happening today, please check the schedule in the hop-in reception area. The main stage will continue at 3.45 Eastern with a performance from Jay Smith. Some of you might remember him as Smitty Kingston, who is a regular performer at the Brass Pub for more than 20 years. I'll see you back then and keep on enjoying your virtual homecoming.